So, so Dwayne, I know you just jumped on, but we're, we're live streaming right now. We just started. So, um, so anyway, here we go. So, the, um, so to everybody who's watching this uh, um, streaming on YouTube, some of you will be here in Zoom too, but we are live. Um, uh, for all of you watching this, this is the first base camp of spring 2022. Um, and it is, I guess, the, the, the way that we're curating base camp this entire year and maybe especially so in the spring is through this idea of landing things, um, taking things that might be um, either either uh, uh, highly speculative and, and unable to land or, or things that we may, maybe don't spend so much time articulating at SIRE, um, things that we often associate with practice. I think we're, we're trying to have a more open discussion and dialogue about, um, about what those, those issues are and, um, and the way I like to think of it is some of these are giving kind of good rules of thumb about approaching some of these subjects that we all will need to approach. And like today's, which is uh, landing a job. Um, so, so, so I'm just gonna ask a few questions of you guys and I'm gonna kind of hang into the background a little bit, but just to get it started. Uh, I thought it would be fun if, um, if our guests who are John Enright, Devin Weiser, Dwayne Euler and Jackie Bloom um, I thought it would be great if each one of you could start by um, telling us how you landed your first job in architecture. So, whoever. <laughs> well, okay. Uh. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, it's funny. I wasn't sure if this was going to be about, you know, how to get a job as a young architect in a place or how to get a job like a commission as an architect. So, and I was kidding with my students and one of them said, both good things to learn. So either way. Let's do both. Let's do thing. both. Yes. Yeah. And I was telling him a story of, uh, well, for myself, I was lucky enough to have an uncle who's an architect. So I worked for him one summer when I was about 15. So I kind of knew what an architect was, what they did. But then they, this is a, an anecdotally a kind of story about failure and perseverance, perhaps. But as a third year undergraduate student, my two friends and I said, hey, let's not go home for the summer. Let's drive to Boston from Syracuse in a VW bug and let's get a job working in a firm. And said, okay. And we literally had rolls of drawings. We didn't have a portfolio. It wasn't reduced. We had a tube and we had a list of every firm in Boston and we had a map. And so we strategically broke the city apart into districts. And then we walked the city and we would do like ABC, like John goes to this firm and Mark goes to the next firm. Cause you wouldn't do all three a cold calling through the office. And we proceeded to do this. We were sleeping on the floor of somebody's bedroom at Tufts or something, a friend of a friend. And we attacked the city literally this way, cold calling every firm. And every once in a while, one of us would get like, oh yeah, I'll look at your stuff. And you'd be there for half an hour. And then they'd go, yeah, sorry, we don't have anything. And they'd let you go. And the other two idiots would be outside on the street with our tubes of drawings waiting for the next destination. So we did this for over two weeks. And then we started to lower our expectations with each round of round <laughs> of rejection of no, get out of here. We're not hiring, you know, or, you know, whatever. And uh, we said, well, if one of us gets a job in a firm, the others will bartend for the summer and that'll be okay. You know? And then it, we just kept lowering and lowering. And so anyway, none of us got a job that way. And we all had to go back uh, you know, home for the summer. And I eventually answered some kind of ad in the paper and I did get hired by a local architect for the summer. Uh, so I don't, you know, I tell that just because it sucked so much and we were so like full of like, of course we're going to get jobs. We were naive. I was 21 years old. I was just like, I have skills now and, I, and they're valuable. And, you know, and I was full of like positivity and it, it was, it was really hard at the end, but I, so I just keep telling that to, to everybody and you just have to be, you have to do things like that and network and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I, I think it, it was really hard this last couple of years. I know for a lot of students, you know, to, to do that and working remote, but 
everybody has stories like that and it's like um you just have to keep going at it and just put yourself out there and then at some point something breaks so that's my story of my first like not job of, <laughs> or attempt i have a similar story um when i finished undergrad um, in Kansas, I, I had some little jobs that I got kind of through school contacts that were really short-term things, but my goal was to go to New York and, and work for someone there. And I had um, zero money. Um, uh, and so I'd taken this job for the summer just so I could, could have enough to have a plane ticket or gas money. I think it was, no, I didn't take a car. So uh, plane ticket to New York. And um, I did what John did but uh, first by mail and phone calls. And I, I had a list of, if I remember right, 60 firms uh, all over New York of, you know, it really, really everyone. I sent to everyone. And uh, one person agreed to talk to me by phone. Uh, the firm, Mitchell Jergala was the firm. Uh, and uh, didn't work out. And uh, we were approaching the end of the summer and uh, I was getting a little desperate and some friends said, well, we have, uh, we know someone that works there that went to Kansas State, you should, you should talk to them. Um, and so I felt a little defeated, but this was my only way to get to New York was I took this job for a, a big corporate firm, uh, Brennan Beer Gorman, they, they don't exist anymore, but they, they weren't a particularly good for, firm. But I went and the day I, I had a, a rule and that was, uh, no matter how bad you, no matter how much you don't like the firm, uh, you, you absolutely cannot stay less than six months. Uh, it's just, it's, it's outrageous. Even six months is outrageous. I, I would really put that rule at, at a year if you have any respect at all for the firm. <laughs> uh, but I went there and the day I started, they had these little phone booths at the time and you could go in that phone booth and you could make private phone calls. And I said, well, I'm in New York now. It'd be easy for people to talk to me. I'm just going to tell them, hey, I could come by and show you my stuff. No commitment. I'm not, you know, I'm not even sure I really said I was looking for a job. I just wanted to talk to them. And I put four, there were four people I tried to talk to. And it seems like the most random list ever now. Uh, Toshiko Mori, Stephen Hall, Levius Woods, and the Hariri sisters. Um, and I started calling them. And within... Uh, Six months, exactly six months later, I quit and I went to work for Toshiko during the day and Levius at night. And I was freelancing for a, a lighting design firm that was doing Stephen Hole buildings. The moral of the story is uh, when I when I tried to call all of those people and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm from far away and it, it's going to, you know, I'm going to sit in front of you and uh you know, beg for a job. I think it was, they, they felt there was a little bit of commitment in that, that they didn't want to take when it was just, I'm here, I could stop by, let's have coffee. I'll show you my work. Uh, everyone was happy to do that. Everyone was incredibly generous. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a heck of a lot easier than being from far away and asking for the commitment. So, uh, same lesson as John's persistence. Uh, all those people, it, it was important to say, I had to pick up the phone. I had to actually talk to them. Uh, you know, this, the, we've changed from uh, calling someone to first sending an email and then maybe texting and saying, can I call you back then you just had to call. And there was something very personal about that. So it was, it was harder in a sense, but it was easier in a sense because you could just call. Maybe I'll go next. Um, I, I've had four jobs um, at offices. Two were um, very short summer internships during my undergrad years. Uh, one was a five-year um, stay um, after undergrad and one was a 10-year stay after graduate school. Um, I've, I've been super lucky. I don't know how this happened, but I, I haven't had to sort of perceive each these jobs. These were connections that I made in schools and um, I ended up being asked to work um, in these offices. So I've always had a portfolio ready and resume ready, but at, you know, right at the time um, in the summer when you're about to sort of pursue work um, in 
like pure luck, um, lucky situations. Um, these people asked me to come and, uh, you know, work as an intern or work in their offices. Um, but I think that once um, I got there feeling a little bit tentative about like whether or not, you know, is this long term or am I, am I here just to, you know, work on this one competition? I think there was a kind of, uh, you know, um, desire to really sort of make make a play to say, you know, I'd like to stay and work here, especially the the job after um, undergrad. Um, I was where I was asked to work for Kevin Daly and Chris Genick on a small competition, um, and they were putting together a small team to make a model. Um, and I somehow just got pulled into this um, little model making team. Um, but I really sort of loved um, the way uh, Kevin and Chris were working and the kind of projects that they were working on. Um, and I really wanted to sort of stay. So, um, I, you know, once you're in that office, you want to, you, you want to kind of, you know, demonstrate uh, your skill level, um, your ability to sort of collaborate with the team and things like that. So um, I think, you know, although I got lucky in, in that I got my foot in the do in the door pretty easily. Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of kind of anxiety in trying to stay in these positions. Hello, um, it's good to see everyone. Uh, my story is maybe a little bit more like Jackie's as well. I had a summer internship between sophomore and junior year, and then between uh, junior and senior year. Uh, while I was at RISD in the uh, BARC program there. And I returned home from Providence to Los Angeles to work for uh, two different firms during uh, the summer break. I was uh, very fortunate. I interviewed and um, they hired me and I spent all summer there and it uh, was really a uh, remarkable and wonderful experience. Um, one of the one of the offices was actually on Wilshire Boulevard in, in one of these kind of like old noir towers um, with the view of LA. And then um, after senior year, I was actually asked by Peter Testa to work with him and Elvira Siza and pretty much the rest is history from that point on. And we ultimately formed our own practice uh, together and have been doing that for quite a, quite a long time. So, um, Moving from internships to um, my own my own firm, and which I think is uh, maybe one of the things we could also talk about today. What does it mean to kind of form your own practice, and not only uh, land a job at someone else's, but what it what does it mean to kind of set up your own your own office? Cool. Yeah, that sounds great. How about um, you, John? Should... Well. Um, uh... Well, I was, it's funny, I was thinking about what you and John were saying. I, I had a similar kind of experience. I decided, I, I went to Berkeley for undergrad and and uh, it was clear that everything that was cool was happening in LA. So like, and I, I don't know if you guys remember this book, but it was called Experimental Architecture. And it had, it had Russell Thompson and Eric Kahn's city on the front of it. So that's actually how I knew Russell first was from that book. And I had that book and I, and I was looking through it. I'm like, yeah, that's where I'm going to go. So I went down to LA and um, and I, I just started knocking on doors and I ended up at Morphosis actually, John, I don't know if you were there in 92, uh, but I just walked in. Yeah, I remember there was no security or assistant or anything in the front. So I just walked right in and started talking to people <laughs> inside and they're like, they're like, eh, maybe not. And then, uh, and I went to Frank Gehrys who only at that time had like 15 people working for him, which is kind of mind boggling to imagine. And they didn't have any work. This was kind of a recession year. And, uh, and then somehow I got connected back to Morphosis and they said, well, we don't have anything, but our buddy Wolf just moved in behind Moss over there uh, in Moss's building and needs people. So then I just, I had a job the next day at Wolf with Wolf and that's kind of, yeah, so <laughs> strange. And at some point, Darren insists that I hired him uh, as a model builder to work with me at Himmelblau and it's so long ago and I, I kind of remember it, but it was really funny. So like, like I, we were in a, it was the same thing. We were just desperate for people and he was somehow randomly available. And that's how I got to know Darren. It's a small world. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. Um, okay, cool. 
Well, um, I mean, this conversation can go anywhere you guys want it to go, and, but I definitely like the idea that it would it, it can go from like our own you know personal anecdotal things to you know ideas about landing a job in a company. So maybe we just flip. We can go wherever you want, but maybe we just flip right over to like and you know since since all of us uh, you know kind of have our own practices. What I guess I'll ask the question there. So how did you land your first job in your practice? John. Uh, what, our first commission? Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, uh, well, um, I, well, I was lucky in that, um, you know, well, I, you know, I worked for Tom Bain for 13 years. So right out of graduate school, eventually made it to, so that's a whole other funny story, but I'll spare everyone that, but so eventually, uh, uh, that starts in 1987 and I was there till 2000. And then, uh, Margaret started Griffin Architects in around 97, I want to say, out of a little apartment on Riviera in Venice that had been a hand-me-down apartment. It was actually a former girlfriend of mine that our friend had it, and it was like $350 a month. It was owned by this old man who just didn't want any trouble. Like, you, you, you had to fix everything yourself, but it was only $350 bucks a month, like, literally you know eight blocks from the beach right off Abikini and so that was her office and it was just a little one-bedroom apartment and she had worked for Narduli Grinstein and then uh, Elise Grinstein who was actually a former board member of SciArc really interesting woman who uh, was married to Stanley Grinstein, uh, who collected art they started the Gemini gel print shop that you may have heard of uh, and Elise uh, was educated at UCLA mid-career after she had children uh, and went to architecture school. I think it was late 70s or 80s. In any case, uh, Elise was very well connected and started to feed Margaret work because she had worked there and then Elise left that firm. And Elise was just high energy and would just wanted to be in, in, involved in architecture. And so she started introducing Margaret to friends and Margaret had a house that she was doing. And then when I made the difficult decision in many ways to leave Morphosis to join Margaret right before our daughter was born in 2000, we joined forces and I literally went from an office uh, where, and you know, Tom you, and I maybe, and, and all of us who worked for large firms and were a key part of it. It's like a big organization. I was doing big buildings. Like I walked into that place and there were like 18 people that wanted a piece of me. And I was like highly like supercharged and I'm traveling to Europe every six weeks and doing all this stuff. And then uh, that was a Friday. And then on a Monday, I went into this little apartment with one employee and Margaret eight and a half months pregnant. And I just looked at, his name was Ray. And I'm like, hi, Ray. And he was like, hi. <laughs> and I was like, what do we do? You know, it was like such a different shift. And then right away, it was just like things started to open up and we had that little house and I helped detail it. And then uh, we were introduced to people at CalArts and we did a little interiors there and we just started. And I don't you know, I always say this and they, someone said it to me during the time, like when you're at an office, and you want to start your own office, like how to transition from that. You, I'm uh, it's a little bit chicken in the egg. No one's going to give you a commission while you're working for someone else. Generally, they're like, look, you're not on your own. How are you going to do it? And then once you do that and like you, you know, all of a sudden people reach out for you because they're thinking about you. It's like, Oh, now you're available and work kind of comes in the first two years just by all the connections you have, if you're lucky. And that happened to us. And uh, that was 2000. And then, uh, you know, a couple, a year later, we were out of the apartment, we bought a little building and then the work just started to build up kind of from there, but it was super scary. I mean, I, I tell people like, you know, part of my relationship with Margaret, which goes, we were educated at the same school. We've now known each other 40 years, which is amazing. But, uh, you know, she offers me as a partner that leap of faith like she was the one who was like we can do this I was like what are you talking about we're having a kid like we can't <laughs> like how are we gonna afford it like I I was much more like this isn't gonna work out you know 
And she's like, what are you kidding me? It's totally going to work. And then I took that leap with her and it was fantastic. Of course, it's like the last 20 years have been amazing. So that's like, uh, maybe that's another thing, which is about risk. And, you know, all of us who have our, we all have our own offices and there's risk related to that. You have to put yourself out there. You're, uh, if there's financial risk, there's all sorts of things and it. And it's not for everybody, you know, and, and I have great friends who work in larger organizations and that's okay. And they're very talented people and parts of, uh, making, uh, important work, but, um, that's another kind of transition. Like, yeah, when you, when you start your own office and, and how that happens and how you support it. And I always say there's not one path, like everybody has different paths to it. Like, I mean, I respect my colleagues who started like really early, like they, some people start right out of school and they're like, I'm, I'm an architect, let's figure it out. Like I couldn't operate that way. So I had to do like the better part of a decade and I was 37 when we started the office. So on the other hand, I have a hell of a lot of experience. So it was like, I was ready. I could take on a lot of things. I didn't have a lot of technical questions. I had a lot of know-how because I had been through the ringer on these like pretty major complicated projects. So I had the advantage of confidence, but then still it was like, nobody's, you know, it was funny. I was like, I went from running 35, $40 $40 million projects to someone going, but you've never done a house from the ground up. <laughs> you know? And you're like, what the hell? What are you talking about? Because you don't get any credit until you start building up mm -hmm. your own work and your mm -hmm. own portfolio. And so I had a friend, Nuno Mateus in Portugal, who described it this way when I asked him in the 90s when he started his office. He said, oh yeah, man, you have to make your own history really fast. <laughs> and I'm like, right you ha you have no history because that history doesn't count it's like like tom you the buildings you did with him amazing things i know what you did with those i know like how much experience you got but again like to the outside world it's like yeah 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 no you know what have you done on your own yeah you, you have to make that history and that's what we all do whether it's mm -hmm. competitions real projects hypothetical projects research whatever we're doing you're building that body and kind of um starting over in a lot of ways. John, I remember um, when I interviewed with you for a job at, to teach at SciArc, um, I was um, kind of at a crossroads, right? I had, just I had just finished 10 years working for Greg Lynn. Um, I was starting to do some speculative collaborative work with Florencia. And I also had just started um, uh, a small remodel on my own. And I think you were telling me um, your story about how you transitioned from, um, so it wasn't much of an interview. It was much more of a pep talk. I came out of that interview feeling like I was like, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> and, you know, like yeah. start everything and start teaching as well. But yeah, I, I I, that. yeah that's great. And it's interesting that both of you mentioned there was a sort of um, a decade of doing something and there this seems to be a very common um, amount of time after one leaves school whatever you work on it takes kind of like 10 years to sort of figure out again or to sort of settle down and um, then proceed you know with your own practice or um, start teaching there's this um, period of time that really uh, takes, takes an effort to figure out who am I that is not just part of my schooling, but who am I trying to become as a designer? And that I think is just a, that's a kind of natural amount of time. I think for even any artist, like you develop techniques, you develop your ideas, you hone things, you kind of make your networks. Um, so I think like in our, in our situation, there was this sort of a, a 10 year period as well that involved like teaching, um, but also research at MIT. And then our first, what I would call like commissioned project that was, you know, kind of fully designed um, was in 1999 was the, the King's Road shop. And, and that was through a woman who actually, um, owned a, a, a store there and did um, 
did design and um, and custom couture. And I was very involved in that at the time, having worked in New York in the fashion industry. And um, basically the, 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 the kind of the building she was in was like really, really uh, in need of an, an upgrade. <laughs> and so we designed a, a, a whole new building for that block. And that I think was an amazing experience because you had both your own interests um, but you also had the sort of like the client starting to put constraints on things and that 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 experience led to probably the most fund I would say the kind of um, most fundamental project of our practice that set everything in motion and and that's also I think a really exciting time in an office like that that first commission is where you kind of like think about everything you're like okay like this is it like we're really going to make this count. What, like, what are we actually working on? And that project had maybe three whole designs before we kind of really understood like, okay, this is, this is what we are going to propose. And so um, the first commission, I think is such a, an important, but also just like a kind of a touchstone in anyone's practice. You like, remember the the things that you learned and sacrificed and the ambitions for the project. I, I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure Dwayne remembers that as well, but like that kind of first project, it holds a special place, at least in, my, in kind of like in my heart. It's like, it's always a, a, a point of reference. Yeah, I have some of those, but the truth is the first, what I would consider five years of our practice, I honestly can't even remember what the first commission was because they weren't even really like what I would consider a commission today. They were like, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll design and build that thing for peanuts or we'll do this little proposal for a, you know, a, a kind of honorarium amount. And we literally spent years just scraping together a lot of those. Um, the, the, you know, and then we did a, our own apartment and we did a, a backyard deck for Jenny's parents, like little things like that. They weren't really paying money, uh, but we were teaching to, to survive and you know, they, they added a little something. The first real commission, I, I guess I'd have to say um, all the credit goes to Jenny. Um, she at some point decided uh, that she should start knocking on doors in Taiwan. And there's this misconception that the, the work came um, from her having some deep family contacts. And that's absolutely not true. Um, her, her, her parents knew a little bit, uh, just enough to say, oh, you might, you know, here's, a, here's an important developer in town or here's someone you should talk to. And so she, when she would go to Taiwan uh, for a couple of weeks, she would literally just schedule appointments with some developers. And uh, we had a couple that didn't pan out. And uh, eventually she met with uh, someone who was really the son of, uh, of a developer there who was uh, kind of training to become the boss and, and is now uh, become the boss. And we did an installation for them. And within a couple of years, they had uh, commissioned us to do a tower. And so our joke is always that we we kind of got our first commission because these developers in Taipei looked at that backyard deck and said, yeah, I, I think they're ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I mean, I, I, can, um, I can totally relate, Devin, to what you're saying about the kind of first project. And it, it, for me, maybe it's not, it, maybe it wasn't my first commission, but the first job that I did where I felt that weight of like not of like not messing it up and also not trying to control um control the number of ideas that I put into it because you kind of have been you know you're saving up all your ideas and then you get this one chance to to, to do it to build it and you want to put everything in there which is of course a total mistake you got to like play the long game I think and maybe focus on one thing you need to do in that project but it's it's definitely hard to do that um I think that was that was uh, something that I, I did a whole lot of versions too when I was doing this cinema project for Wolf on that. But it is so true. Like when I started doing like um, maybe, maybe like this tower, this not tower, this billboard that I'm doing now, I, I felt that exact same stress all over again. Cause it was like, Oh my God, what can I get done? This isn't even a building. What can I do? Am I going to try to do too much? And, and it was funny. Um, Tom Main called me as he was driving by it the other day 
And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, you need some bigger projects. He's like, you tried to put everything in that, didn't you? And he was totally, he totally had my number. I was laughing. I'm like, yeah, we, we designed it like a Swiss watch at the end because we just couldn't stop designing on it because it was sitting here and we're like, oh, this is so important. And, but then it's now that it's almost done. You're like, oh, I've already moved on and I'm doing other stuff and it's fine. But, but I definitely felt that. Um, and also that, you know, a, a real perception, John, like what you said about risk and about what it is to now, you know, sign my name on something and make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm taking good, making good records along the way and trying to, you know, not let uh, um, disagreements and fights blow up, you know, on the project and all that, which is a whole other part of it too. So, um, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> That's a, that's another, it reminds me of this discussion we had, uh, we were, Francia brought us in and Tom and I to talk about this high school that I did with him, his high school, the Diamond Ranch High School. It was about strategy, Tom. I think something you said touched on it. It's like, then one's got an office and working on projects and then different opportunities come up and different mindsets. So like, personally, I would have answered Tom like, yeah, you're damn right. I put all into it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. Since it's like you make a billboard, not a billboard. And in fact, he did that same thing. So look at the 2468 house by Morphosis from 1979, where they drew every single screw on a one room <laughs> square house yeah. with four windows. So, uh, <laughs> The work up until in that office, up until the early 90s, was known for a kind of fetishization. And Tom himself will call himself a tinkerer and uh, attention to detail at an amazing level. But it also represented a bunch of individuals with so much energy that, of course, like if even designing a chair was like almost like a city, right? It's because of the energy they put in. Mm -hmm. Now, then you're faced with a state budget school project which you know is a different animal and what was amazing about tom was his acknowledgement and understanding and we had this discussion I'm just quickly the last was you know i said to him, you're not designing the bathrooms and he was like what do you mean <laughs> and i'm like we already did their white you know or something their white tile done and and he i said because you can't we can't this kind of project is about the public space, the big moves, you know, that's what it's going to be about rough materials. That's this kind of project. It's not a boutique. It's not um, a showroom. It's not a house, you know, for a, a gazillionaire. And so, and, and Tom's very strategic that way and understood his whole career has been able to pivot that way, but then simultaneously and understand the problem at hand in a way and to, to, to be able to do the project. So, it's very interesting when you look at his, his career, the mid nineties were these kind of larger projects, but the focus changes that it's not just the formal strategies because those evolve as well, but it's also an understanding of like um, where the larger moves are in a project. I think this is something like all mature architects mm -hmm. figure out and understand. I think Frank yes. Gary knows this, uh, you know, like, uh, and you could take apart any of those buildings. They're all related to kind of larger, the very, very simple parts, and then parts that are actually really articulated. And it's that's funny, John. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I totally, I think that way now too. And we always try to. And it doesn't always work, but the intention is at the beginning of a project to label it a, a, a 90-10, 80-20, 70-30, 50-50 project. So like 50%, you know, like big moves, and then 50% neutral or background. And, you know, and you just kind of, if I find it does help if we kind of, if the, everyone in the team understands which one it is um, in terms of just like also lowering the number of like design studies we might do on something from the get-go rather than saying like, we can do anything. It's like, no, it's, this is a 90-10. Like you could do a courtyard in a box, you know, maybe a, or a slanted wall, but then no courtyard you know, or whatever it is. But I find that to be like, I think you're so right, John. I think it's like something you've got to, you, you've, I'm not even particularly good at it, but I'm aware that it's something I need to do to, to get to the next level, you know? Yeah. In okay. The, in the, yeah. Sorry, I, I was gonna say in that first project that I, I was commissioned to work on, which was a, a small remodel on the Venice boardwalk. Um, it was retail at the lower level and two apartments at the top level and a very limited budget um, 
And so in trying to think of like, where can I put any, any, any sort of signature of any design, uh, design um, on this building. And I put it all on the, on the parapet, which is like peeking up above the kind of Venice boardwalk um, elevation um, because um, I couldn't get it really into the interior. I, could, I couldn't really do it. So I put it all into the parapet. It was really simple curved kind of shaped parapet. Um, and they approved it and we went all the way into, um, you know, contractor bid, they selected the contractor and at the last minute, the contractor said, well, this is costing you this much more, this curved thing. And so, you know, it, got, it gets completely eliminated, but, you know, thinking about like where to put your, you know, energy and focus on just to get a project to, you know, it, you know, it's a little bit deflating, but a good lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I have another question here. Um, Maybe we'll shift back to the um, to students or, or younger people landing a job. So when someone lands a job with all of you, what are the things that you hope for them or what are your what, what are your expectations and hopes for them in your in your practice? Well, I, I like mean, how would you like them yeah. to be and contribute? You know, well, I think uh, I like this question comes up a lot, like big office, small office, like whatever that means. So, like um, to me, I mean, well, I don't know what the terms exactly are, but like let's say thirty people and less is one category, and thirty people and more is another. Like that's how I would kind of do it, and so. Um, my entire career at Morphosis, we were never larger than 30. That happened all after I left, after 2000. So uh, much larger. So I always felt like 30 for a partner or, ser or two partners is like, a, it's like a Greek ideal city. It's manageable at that number. And there's not too many politics and layers of hierarchy. It's like a family above that. And the organization changes. You need other kinds of structures that I'm not really familiar with, kind of corporate ones. But the... Most important thing, I think, and probably we're all within that under 30 number, I think we are. <laughs> so uh, what we offer, uh, and most, actually most architects in the country are in that office number, you know, 30 and below. It's the exception, it's the bigger ones. There's, there's, uh, and they're very big, but there's not that many of them. Uh, is, you know, what exposure a young architect gets to like the whole totality of what, doing architecture is and the small firm always offers everybody does a little bit of everything from taking out the garbage to in our cases open offices where you listen to client meetings even if you're not in one you get to see in our case an amazing person an architect margaret griffin running around making it rain all the time as anyone should know or anyone knows who works there I'm mostly at Cyarch and probably like 30 percent at griffin and right and she's the inverse of that and so I have a, a strong partner who's really running the show in the office day to day. I work on much of the work there, but it's like very siloed in a lot of ways. Uh, but, but in that uh, is exposure to, in this case, two partners and, and our team of, um, you know, all facets of the work, which you don't get in the larger organizations. Uh, they have other things, security and maybe more money and things like that. But um, I think that's invaluable to young people. So I always encourage that they work in the smaller firms and just absorb, 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 because really we all know, as, as Devin said, it's 10 years, uh, maybe it's, it's not always that long, maybe at least five that it takes to, um, we still, and as educators, we're all very proud of what you end up on that first day at graduation, but we also know your education's just beginning in a lot of ways. And so, it is still a field, particularly if you're interested in manifesting buildings and building them, that is a huge amount of learning done in that first five years. So in order to get what you wanna do, you, you have to be in a place that's building, 
that has to have exposure to that and access to construction sites and clients and permitting and all this stuff. And it has to be amazing work. <laughs> so it's like, that's really hard to find those firms and get that experience and, uh, uh, and get exposed by it. I mean, I think I would say that we can speak for all of us that were, and this is the way Tom's office has always been, hire highly motivated, smart young people and give them just a little bit more responsibility than they can handle. Not too much where it's like, but just, and they will figure out a way uh, to, to, to go about it. And so I, I think that's the kind of environment we try to make. And we understand that it's a learning process, that it's, uh, that it's uh, another chapter in their learning like that. They don't always understand what something, how something works out there without that, that experience as I didn't when I was exactly that age and in that same position and had to absorb, absorb, absorb. And then my advice also, and so even if you're in a large firm or a small firm, they're just uh, taking notes, right? Take notes because later, like I, to this day, I've never worked in an organization larger than 30 and I'm fascinated by them. So I have friends that are either in them or were, and I'm always talking to them. Like, how does it work? Like, what are they doing? You know, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't have direct experience in that, but I'm just interested. Like, it's just like, well, there must be something to it. And what are the positives and negatives of that? With the exception of that six month stint with the corporate firm, I, I've always been tiny, tiny firms. And, um, on one hand, I, I love that, but it does mean that um, uh, there's no room for people who can't kind of navigate their way through everything because at any given moment, something has to shift one desk over because another job comes in or because there's some, some other different kind of responsibility we have to do. And in our office, you add all the, nor the normal architectural practice stuff, but there's also fabrication and and sometimes jewelry um, also there. So the, the things that they, you know, people here have to be really nimble in all those categories. And so our goal on one hand is to, to make sure that, uh, you know, within a relatively short time, they, they are completely comfortable working in all of those, all of those realms. Um, I think uh, what you, what you said about uh, Tom John really resonates with me because it's long been the, the goal to give everyone here just enough responsibility that they can barely handle it. Honestly, the struggle uh, for us has been that, uh, like Tom, I think we have really, really, you know, some of the most talented people of their generation here is, is having the work that would allow them, you know, allow us to give them that. And it's, it's felt, uh, you know, for years, like, oh, suddenly, you know, everyone here is going to be flooded with, with the, the work and in that scenario. Um, but the, you know, what, what we want to do is essentially ensure that they, everyone is able to do that. So if there's a race for us, it's to have the kind of work that ensures they're just, you know, barely staying above water. You know, I think what this um, conversation in a way points to though, is that there's different models of practice um, not just like the scale of the office, but different um, levels of uh, control, uh, depending on if there's one person that's the architect or if it's a partnership, um, if, it's an, if it's like more of a local practice or an international practice. And there's so, so many different kinds of opportunities, I think, for the students. And I mean, one of the things I would just um, kind of say is that, for example, even though the practice that I have is very, very specific about certain ideas about construction and position and project. Um, because we also um, work with CESA, there's this kind of um, joint venture going on with another kind of model of practice. And he works ex you know, in a very, very different way. He designs every single thing. And then maybe one or two people stay on a project for you know, five to 10 years to execute it. Um, we don't necessarily have that, although I think that's a sort of a dream way of working. Um, 
our, our practice is a little bit more that we already have many, many projects. And so we can look for people um, that we know will be a kind of a good fit and they'll be inspired to work on that project. And we also know that they maybe already have a tendency. So I would say our, our firm's a little bit different. It's rather than someone coming in and, you know, kind of um, doing a, a sampling, we actually uh, look for quite specific things like this project needs a coder or this project is just about model making or like this project needs someone with a really good eye for color. Um, and I think that over many years now, um, I've kind of like used SciArc um, in the most kind of amazing way. You know, SciArc is like a gallery display and you can look around and you see a student whose work catches your eye. And then I'll just like approach that student, like, you know, uh, did you make that model? I'd like, it's really beautiful. Um, and then a lot, so a lot of, a lot of times uh, I will reach out to students and then other times, you know, we'll just get very lucky that someone reached out to us and they sent a portfolio and it's a good fit. But I would say um, mostly the, the way that we operate in the office is really looking for almost like collaborators more than interns, meaning somebody that you're going to have a, a long-term continuing conversation with. And we've been so fortunate that so many students at SciArc um, and be before SciArc as well, of course, but at SciArc have really been incredibly dedicated and loyal and um, extra extraordinary and uh, made extraordinary contributions to our practice. So perhaps this little moment to shout out to the SciArc students for being so terrific and, and really wonderful um, collaborators for a long time now. Thank you. I mean, I, I could just add one thing to that, Devin. I thought that was great. Um, I guess the, the kind of person I'm always looking for is somebody who wants to make the work their own. So they're not, it's not that relationship where they just work for me, but it's almost like they're working for themselves and it's within my office. So like, I want them to come in and own something, whatever it is, it doesn't, it could be a project. It could be a piece of a project, could be a discipline, could be whatever it, or it could be, you know, model making, construction administration, whatever it is, but somebody who comes in and says like, I want this, like, I want to learn how to do this. I want to get good at this. Um, you know, maybe you can't trust me yet doing it, but I'm going to figure this out. And, um, and that, I, that's always the, the super charming and, and amazing, uh, I think to have people like that in, in the office. So it just, it just scuttles the idea of sort of like labor and like the boss and the employee and all of those things, because they're working within your organization. Yes. But they're like, oh no, I own this, <laughs> you know, I'm the master of this thing. And I, I, that's, that's something that I always, um, that I always appreciate. Um, yeah, and also I would say too, just you know, I think I know people who try to understand like where a firm is at any given time and like what the concerns are or the the risks that are being taken and kind of the the overall situation of the thing and then kind of taking that seriously and understanding you know um, wh where the company is. I just feel like that's also something that's really important to me. Um, not just coming in and saying like. Oh, it's just about me and what I can do and the hours that I worked and this thing and me and, you know, but rather like this is where we are and, and this is where this company is and how can I best contribute at this point in time to this particular entity. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, all right. So it's 4.51. So we're going to go for another like 10 minutes or so. Um, Let's see, no, I skipped that one. Well, you were kind of talking about this, Devin, also that the different choices and things that people have today. Um, and I wonder if everyone would wanna just talk for a second about um, what kinds of things you imagine the students today who are graduating from SIRC today and, and then the next year or two, what kinds of options do they have? What kind of opportunities do they have? What kinds of things do you hope for them? Or do you think that they um, should consider um, uh, as they as they leave school?
anybody. Ambition, just ambition. I, I think the thing that makes CyArk interesting is, is that uh, you can kind of go anywhere from CyArk. You know, there are schools that, that fit into certain categories. They're gonna create a, they're gonna move into corporate culture or they're, you know, they're gonna work in the local firm. You know, there are a lot of schools you can really categorize in that way. And CyArk, I think generally would be considered as, a, you know, people would say, put it in the design category. But design exists on a lot of different levels. It's a much more robust category than the kind of categories that are being applied to other schools. And so, you know, I think they could go anywhere. You could go into computer programming, more general design. Obviously, you could do architecture, Hollywood, corporate, small firm, big firm. Uh, the, the thing, I, I think all of those are, are fine and meaningful places to go. The thing that I think I, I would want for CyArk students is whatever you do, do it with ambition. Do it in the way that you're talking about, Tom, that you, you walk into a place and in the most uh, humble but confident way, uh, think I'm going to rock this, you know, like I'm going to take charge of this. I'm going to own it. When people don't think I'm working on it, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to offer something that's going to make it stronger. Uh, you know, just go at it with full gusto. I, very few people really find happiness in this world by half-assing it. So whatever it is, you know, do it with some ambition. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, when we talk about the school, we talk, uh, I think Devin really hit upon it uh, within our own office, but we attempt at least to give the most focused and most broad kind of education possible. So the, the focus can be laser focused into certain, uh, well, let's say the disciplinary aspects of architecture to be just general, but uh, uh I've found that, and I've been around long enough, I've been lucky enough to somehow stay, I guess, within the profession, but I've had so many colleagues that either through economies or choice or shift had to pivot their way through and around architecture into also very other interesting fields, you know, animation or film or uh, real estate or construction or whatever that might be. And, uh, uh, it may be that like the architects, architectural education is in a sense, the most, one of the last generalist fields, you know, like kind of um, jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. Uh, but I think we do uh, better than most places, exceptionally better in giving a kind of palette, let's say, whether it's techniques, um, viewpoints, skill sets, that are transferable kind of on the fringes of the field as well as like super focused to the field. So I think it's kind of ethically our job to give that to the students of CIRC as they graduate. And if you're not doing that as an educator, I think you're doing something wrong just generally uh, in, the, in the world. And it enables then the student who, you know, well, I went to Zaha's office and I killed it and I drew on this project and now I'm running my own office. Okay, that's one path. Uh, to the other who's, you know, I'm, you know, working for Apple now, developing things I can't talk to you about that are super secret, you know, and you're like, okay, great. And, and so, or I'm a chef or, and I'm 3D printing food, you know, or, or, or all, all these other different things. And so, I'm always careful when I say that and when we talk about it with CyArk because, I mean, I guess why I'm careful about it is that I think the school can be typecast as then not serious about architecture if you allow that kind of thing. And that's why I think it's a moral obligation that we, that we do encourage that kind of transference in and out of architecture, both within the Institute of who teaches there and all our different profiles, which are amazing. So it's never just about buildings, uh, but it's about buildings and that's okay too. It's like, they're not exclusive. And so what I, what I uh, try to impress upon students is that's the robust richness of how you choose to go about your career. And everybody's you know, different about that. And sometimes it's out of your control. Sometimes it's in your control, but I think um, 
we talk about it all the time, Tom. I mean, we talk, we'll talk about it in studios. We'll talk about it pedagogically. Like what's the aim? What are we teaching? <laughs> what's useful? What's not? And uh, it's that uh, people have lots of different opinions about it. And uh, I think ultimately we have to remember it's the student who creates that path and makes those choices. We're just all there offering all these different viewpoints and there are different viewpoints and they, part of their design and the designing of their career are those choices that they make as they navigate towards one or the other, or if you want to talk about building or not building, it's, it's, I don't like that polemic, but um, you know what I mean, right? And I think even as a faculty, we're, we're all very different in our aspirations and what we're interested in, in, in those regards. And uh, that's also part of what makes the kind of bouillabaisse base of Sciarc and all the ingredients going, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, if it was too much of one thing or the other, it'd probably be a problem. I think it's such an important point you're making and also um, the kind of, let's say, um, ambition and passion that that Duane is, is suggesting as well. And that may, maybe from the student side, on one hand, it seems a little bit overwhelming, the buffet. Um, and that's where I think uh, we can always help by uh, mentoring and helping them to curate. And this is where I'll make a, a pitch for their portfolio as well, because that's really maybe the, the moment or the document or the, the log that one can look back and help to self uh, direct and kind of figure out what are you most passionate about? What is your area of expertise? Um, what are your tendencies? And what kind of model of practice might those sort of flow into? And then you can um, do a little bit of uh, navigation within your own education, especially for, I think, in the last couple of years, students can, you know, have more freedom to choose electives and verticals. And I would, I would really encourage the students to um, kind of take charge of their education in that way and, and figure out uh, not after graduation, but a couple of years before graduation, what are those, what are those tendencies and directions? And I think that's something that um, will help, help set things up. And, um, and then the other thing I would say um, and again, to John's point is that I always try to remember that my education is probably, you know, within a certain moment, historical moment and context, and things have changed radically. And we can even just think changed radically in the past two years. Um, the, the way that we interact, the way we collaborate and share, these are all amazing new formats and platforms that are happening. And I think that more and more, um, this is a very particular moment that I'm genuinely excited for the students. I feel like this is like a real door opening um, on design in a very broad way that hasn't, hasn't been so, so clear for about 20 years. This is a kind of one of those like waves that is really gonna, um, I think, shift how we, how we think about design and collaboration with the climate. Um, with new kinds of interfaces, I would just say that, you know, be bold as, as Dwayne's saying, because there's a lot, a lot of um, ways that one can engage practice today. And, and it's just, I don't know, I feel I'm extremely optimistic in the sense that like all these, um, all, all these areas are really transformed by design now, like pretty much everything is designed. Our vaccines are designed, um, our platforms are designed, you know, there's, there's like a role for design across so many areas that I'm, I'm confident that the students um, with just a little bit of kind of reflection on their own interests will find the niche and um, join, join that community and really excel. That's a great point. Um, Devin, I was thinking about um, portfolios and who the portfolios are for. You know, is it for the, the office that you intend to work for? Is, you know, who, who is it for? And thinking about, I mean, now more than ever, you can really figure out who your audience is, just, you know, social media followings and, you know, all of that. And so, um, you know, establishing your niche 
and figuring out how to sort of reach, um, you know, a small community, a small group of, um, you know, thinkers that are interested in the kind of thing that you're doing, I think is so exciting right now. I mean, more than ever, I think anyone can really establish their sort of ground and um, figure out who who's looking at them and following them. So yeah, that's so interesting. I hadn't ever thought of that, Jackie, but you're so right. It's like, we're like, you know, those Amazon bots now that like, know what you want to buy. Whatever <laughs> You can totally direct your connection and your, your sharing of information with others rather than doing like what, you know, like what I, me or John or Dwayne described earlier, which is just like, throw it at everybody and see what sticks. <laughs> um, that's super interesting. Yeah. Huh. Cool. Okay. Um, so it's 502. I do want to ask one last question of everybody and, uh, um, and we will end after that. So, um, what would you or uh, what would your dream job be in your own office, your dream commission? Ours is not that unusual. Um, I think a museum would be the dream job. You know, they, they've, they're they're the kind of thing that for an architect, museums are the things that best represent where we are as a culture. They, they do it the best. Uh, so, you know, that's why you're seeing architects experiment with them. That's why they're often the most interesting buildings out there. Um, so we'll take a museum any day. <laughs> we'll be competing with a lot of other architects, but. Um, well, I, I, there, that's a fantastic question, Tom. Um, I, I would say that um, in part the way that we've constructed our office, we've had many of our dream jobs and um, this is something that I would also encourage the students to do is to say, don't wait for someone to give you the commission. Um, most architecture work is not built um, and that you can really take the initiative to just work on something that you're excited about. And you can, I mean, the amazing kind of digital tools now today uh, make that even easier to, uh, you know, put out there, not only in your portfolio, but in other mediums. So I would, I would encourage everybody to really um, make their own dream commission, if you will. <laughs> um, I know that we did. And then uh, while there's, I think, no, no single um, project, I think that it's, um, there's a, a, there is a project that has been, that we've been joking about for quite a long time. And it's literally called the dream printer. And um, this would be a PhD that I would need to go back to school for and work on, but this would be how one could actually um, visualize and print your dreams. I don't mean like a 3D printer. I mean, like you would actually be able to um, take the images that, I don't know, at least in my dreams are incredibly detailed and you know specific and be able to kind of get that imagery out. So my dream job would be the dream printer, which would help build my dream job. <laughs> well, any, any job is a dream job, you know, any kind of commission is a, is a dream commission. I'm always thinking about the studio projects um, that we're working on. And um, right now in 2GBX, we're thinking about biotech buildings and a new kind of workspace, which is really interesting right now to me. Um, so I've been thinking about that as a kind of uh, work environment, work, you know, office kind of environment. Yeah, I, I would answer it that I would say public buildings, um, but specifically if I had to choose, I think it would actually be library. I would love to do a library. And I feel that libraries, at least in the United States, are the last of truly public interior space that is truly public realms in that you don't need an ID to get in. You, you are allowed to go in, they are free and open. And there's almost no buildings left that are like that, including museums, which are, even if they're free, are semi-privatized in the sense that, you know, in a library, you can just go and sit and treat it like your city's living room as it should be. And 
I, ever since I saw the Seattle Public Library years ago, I think Tom, you and I actually saw it for the first time together with like Russell and Marcello. Mm -hmm. And not that, what I saw was the importance of that typology of, of, the, of the library as a public space. And then maybe then uh, uh, a train station, <laughs> which is also like a portal, an entry to a city that is like, not an airport because I think they're really difficult types, but uh, something at the scale of the public. And we're just starting to do a little bit of, you know, public work at small, but I realized that the discussion is completely different because it takes one out of the personal of an owner, uh, certainly single family houses or anything, restaurants or where their ownership of the project is different when you talk about public work. That's it, um, it's for all of us and it's like we're just um i don't know i think that i think that's a, an interesting type and those that are involved in it i think it's a uh another kind of level of project that i would aspire to right on okay what's your Guys. dream what's your dream job tom oh um that's hard uh, <laughs> it is I, a hard question <laughs> I, I always, I do have a, a kind of like Devin, to your point, I have this kind of dream that like literally is like a dream. And that is to do like just, you know, a building that's the size of a city. And I do spend a lot of time dreaming about that. I always, here's what I always think about. I always wonder like how you could do it as an, as an architect and not kill it by over-designing it and like know how to work on it in such a way that it's real and it's viable, but it also has architectural elements in it that, that are, that are things I want to do. And I just, I think I'm always, I'm always excited about the very, very, very large and trying to figure out how, how architectural design operates at, at that other scale. So I, and I don't have the answer. Maybe that's why it's kind of in a dream world. It's not clear what it is. But yeah. So the VLB, the very large building, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, you guys, thank you so much for, for coming and for the frank talk. I think it's really good. Um, I really enjoy it, but it's also really good for the students um, to hear us just sort of chattering about this, like we might, you know, at each other's houses or at a bar or something and, mm -hmm. and talk about these issues. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation in other base camps this spring. So, so thanks again. And thanks to all the students who are listening, hopefully, on YouTube. We hope you're out there. We'll see you yeah, we'll Zoom and uh, and we'll see you next time. Uh, the next base camp is uh, it is I can tell you right now. It is mm, February 11th, and it is kind of about something. Um, Devin, you were talking about. We're calling it membership, which is an idea about collaboration and new modes of practice mm -hmm. and different different models. And so that that should be really interesting as well. So thanks again, everybody.